Good morning and welcome to worship. Wonderful. We, got, we give God thanks for sustaining and blessing us in this past week. We're encouraged by the reduced numbers of infections in our country. Our local brush with COVID, though, has given us empathy and uh, empathy for the struggle of those around the world wrestling with far greater prevalence and greater consequences from the disease. We bring our concerns for our world to God this morning. Thine is the kingdom, Lord. Thou art the king of kings. Though evil forces seem on earth to hold the sway, thy loyal peoples wait in faith to hail thy crowning day. Our king is victorious. Yes, and we look forward. We come in faith before the king of kings to worship today. We give you thank or thanks and praise, O God, with every knee bowed and every tongue giving you praise. For in you is extravagant mercy and salvation from all that would destroy us. In the first of your mighty wonders, you created the earth, dividing the waters of chaos and bringing forth dry land. In the days of Moses, you divided the sea again and delivered your people from their oppressors, leading them by fire and cloud to the land of freedom. In your child, Jesus Christ, your reign of love and mercy has embraced all who live, and even in our weakness, you uphold us. He was killed but lived again so that he might be Lord of both the living and the dead. Now, whether we live or die, we belong to you. And in gratitude, we share your love and mercy with all. Therefore, with our hearts lifted high, we love for you praise and praise at all times, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Then the angel of God, who had been travelling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. 
Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud and the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots. They had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. May the Lord bless our understanding of that reading this morning. You give 
Well, you've heard the saying, it's all about the journey, not the destination. Do you agree? I know that we love holidays. I'll start planning them a year ahead. And as the organising mum, it's often exhausting and somewhat stressful trying to get away, making sure we've taken care of each detail, packed everything and everyone. But once I'm in the car, I'm in holiday mode and everything slows down. We take the scenic route, eat fish and chips on the beach before check-in. Don't you love the first day of holidays? But the way home is different. We never stay camping for the full time booked. We always repack the car in record time. We eat lunch on the run and choose the very shortest route. We love our holidays and we also really love going home. Well, God wanted to bring his children home after 400 years in a foreign land of harsh enslavement. In the last sermon from Exodus that Laith preached, it was about God revealing himself in a burning bush. Well, afterwards, God told Moses to gather the elders of Israel to inform them that God had seen their misery, that he was concerned for them, and that he had a plan to deliver them home to their own sweet home, a land flowing with milk and honey. And the elders bowed down and worshipped. They were so relieved to be going home. And following this, God displayed miracle after miracle uh, as he prepared for, he showed his power of deliverance with miracle after miracle. We see Moses' rod became a snake that then morphed back into a rod and then Moses' hand became leprous and then healed, good as new. The Nile River flowed blood red. Then Egypt hopped with frogs, lice and flies A disease consumed all the livestock, excepting the Israelites' beasts, and they'd got sent boils made from ashes, hail and fire streamed down, and God orchestrated a plague of locusts. The devastating miracle that convinced Pharaoh that God is Lord of all was the death of every single Egyptian firstborn. And with this tenth plague, Pharaoh finally conceded defeat and ordered Moses to gather his people and their stock and to leave his land forever. And he ordered that Moses bless him. I love that bit. And after so much resistance, the Egyptians urged the Israelites to leave immediately because they feared what could happen if they defied God one second longer. And so finally, in in accordance with God's plan, the Israelites moved on out in the middle of the night And again, the Israelites bowed down low and worshipped their saving God. This was their watershed moment. They were rescued, free of the Egyptians and finally on their way home. It's not all about the journey. Now, the journey home begins and something surprising happens. God provides guides for his people, a pillar of cloud to follow by day and a pillar of fire to lead by night. How cool. I wish I had that. But yet there's another surprise. God uses these guides to take them not the quickest route, not the smoothest or easiest road, not even the scenic path. No, he takes them the longest possible way. Home was the land called Canaan and if Israel took the direct route they could easily reach their promised land in just over a week. It was so close, but God didn't choose this. The cloud and fire led to wilderness, where the Israelites quickly hit a dead end, the Red Sea. And what's worse, Pharaoh had since reneged his decision to forfeit his cheap labor and also his desire for God's blessing. And now he was pursuing the Israelites with soldiers and chariots and weapons. And as the Egyptians marched ever closer, this must have been one terrifying confusing moment for those Israelites. God had clearly displayed his care for them, repeatedly proven his faithfulness and mighty power, but now after following God out of their comfort zone, the Israelites were facing another impossible situation. Why would God bring them here? Already in their terror, the Israelites were doubting God and wishing they'd never left Egypt. And this lack of trust was actually the reason God brought the children this way. We read in Exodus 13, verse 17, 
When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. The people were not yet ready to face their enemies and move forward with God. They were still suffering the effects of their forced submission under Pharaoh. So God had yet another miracle in store, one every bit as marvellous as those previous. God's response to Israel's indignant cries of fear was one of encouragement. Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord today. Now Moses was instructed to lift his staff with one hand over the sea, sorry, lift his staff and his hand over the sea and divide it like that. And God sent a strong wind that divided the sea, creating a dry floor to walk on. The Israelites walked through the sea, the waters a wall on each side of the passage. And this lasted all night so that hundreds of thousands of Israelites, all of them, were safely delivered to the other side. Well, let's take a little moment to imagine what this was like. How did they walk? Dancing? Triumphantly? Tiptoeing? Or did they rush through? running for their lives. (laughs) Was it noisy? I know crashing waves and sea winds can be deafening, but underwater is peacefully muffled. Would it feel cool in the passage? Would you reach out and touch the water? Would you be afraid that it would collapse in on you? (laughs) Would you be found gazing into those miraculous walls to see what creatures peered back at you? Or would you run for your life to the safety of the other side? I like to imagine it as a triumphal procession. God had rescued them again. The Egyptians assuredly were not in any mood to explore their fantastic surroundings. Remembering too late God's previous responses to their disobedience, Israel's enemies developed blind panic as they became stuck in the mud. Their calls to turn back immediately were cut short as the walls of sea collapsed in on them. Why did God lead the Israelites this way? Well, as the Israelites collected the weapons of the Egyptians washed up on the shore, they realised once again that God, their God, is faithful and he delivers his children from the evil that enslaves them. And more than that, this righteous God exacts justice. God destroys the enemies that that enslave his children. Those under the protection of God have nothing to fear and this knowledge was essential in order for the Israelites to reclaim their land and to make it home. It's all about the journey, not the destination. The Israelites learn that God can take care of their enemies and whatever enslaves them. So what other life lessons were learned on the long way home? Let's say the Israelites discovered on this day that there is no going back. Egypt was now very obviously cut off for them. As the waters crashed back into place, I expect they realised there was nothing for them in their old life of slavery. Their future was solely in following God. Even when God's way seemed indirect, irrational or unclear, the Israelites could trust in his saving power and his goodwill for them. But old habits die hard. We know that this was a lesson God would have to keep teaching and keep teaching all along the way. And finally, the Israelites were taken the long way home so they could understand that the true destination is life with God. They spent years under the leadership of Pharaoh. And God had a perfect rest in store for the Israelites. But even without the gift, God would be He would always be more than enough for his children. In the 40-year journey down the long way home, God provided everything needed, food, protection, guidance, wisdom, even a code to live by, with nothing to lean on but a God who loved them and wanted the best for them. The Israelites would learn more vital lessons, such as how to be free, how to follow God, and how to trust him. On the long way home, the Israelites were gifted with a journey of quality time with God. And when the time was finally right, God's people would be truly ready to receive their promised gift. So how does this story relate to us? Well, I think most of us like to plan our lives out. We'll have this qualification first, 
finish it in the minimum required time, then we'll work for X amount of years, maybe get married, and if we do, we'll buy a house before having 2.3 children or some other plan. <laughs> but things don't often go exactly as intended. Life gets in the way and we find ourselves taking the long way, facing a dead end, and sometimes we're left wandering in the wilderness. Scripture often depicts the experience of God's presence or blessing with the imagery of streams, rivers and oceans. The wilderness is a place where water is scarce, where we travel alone in the heat and cold without shade or protection, and wild animals live there. In the wilderness, God feels doubtful or uncertain, absent and unresponsive. A wilderness can take the form of, of depression, a crisis of faith, one or more traumatic life events, of which the list is endless. For some of us, this corona situation has become like a spiritual drought, a wilderness, and there's not much solace in a wilderness experience. But it should encourage us to know that all Christians experience it. And even Jesus was led this way. His ministry had just started coming together when he was sent into the desert for 40 days and nights, left to contend with Satan. Some of us have this long wilderness. Some of us have short visits. But we all get taken there at some stage. So what can I hear God saying to us this morning? God wants us to hear this morning that he can handle any difficulties that we're facing. He has the power to set us free from whatever enslaves us, whatever pulls us back from the full life that he's planning for us. He came through for the Israelites repeatedly and for Jesus when he was tempted in the desert. And he can help you deal with your greatest fears, weaknesses and temptations. He can handle any people or circumstances that threaten you. In your wilderness, go ahead and call on God. Our, then watch and wait, because our God saves. He saves us. God wants us to hear that there is no turning back. In the wilderness, it be, can be tempting for us to give up and return to our old lives. God took the Israelites through the sea and let it close back into place. When we remember the past, let them be memories about the faithfulness of God. The wilderness won't last forever. Home will be worth it, and our God is faithful to us. And it's all about the journey. In the wilderness, we can also learn that the destination is actually God. We can trust him for everything we need. Even in the wilderness, he's capable and eager to provide us with everything we need. And he wastes nothing. In the wilderness, he's busy teaching us to value most our relationship with him, how to follow him, how to trust him, how to be free. He is the way to being finally home. It's all about the journey and the destination. May you find great joy whilst taking the long way home.
The second verse of our sending song this morning says, From the fears that long have bound us, free our hearts to faith and praise. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of these days. Our God of grace longs to hear and answer this prayer for us today. Let's stand together and we're going to sing together, God of grace and God of glory. Now the benediction. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>